Chapter Twenty, Part Two of Fifty Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. Chapter Twenty, Part Two. In my situation, there was nothing too hazardous for me to undertake, and I informed him that if he would let me hide myself in the hold of the ship amongst the bags of cotton, no one should ever know that he had any knowledge of the fact, and that all the danger and all the disasters that might attend the affair should fall exclusively on me. He finally told me to go away and that he would think of the matter until the next day. It was obvious that his heart was softened in my favor, that his feelings of compassion almost impelled him to do an act in my behalf that was forbidden by his judgment and his sense of duty to his employers. As the houses of the city were now closed, and I was a stranger in the place, I went to a wagon that stood in front of the warehouse, and had been unladen of the cotton that had been brought in it, and creeping into it, made my bed with the driver, who permitted me to share his lodgings amongst some corn-tops that he had brought to feed his oxen. When the morning came, I went again to the ship, and when the people came on deck, asked them for the captain, whom I should not have known by his dress, which was very nearly similar to that of the sailors, on being asked if he did not wish to hire a hand to help load his ship, he told me I might go to work amongst the men if I chose, and he would pay me what I was worth. My object was to procure employment on board the ship, and not to get wages, and in the course of this day I found means to enter the hold of the ship several times and examine it minutely. The black sailor promised that he would not betray me, and that if I could find the means of escaping on board the ship, he would not disclose it. At the end of three days the ship had taken in her loading, and the captain said in my presence that he intended to sail the day after. No time was now to be lost, and asking the captain what he thought I had earned, he gave me three dollars, which was certainly very liberal pay, considering that during the whole time that I had worked for him my fare had been the same as that of the sailors, who had as much as they could consume of excellent food. The sailors were now busy in trimming the ship and making ready for sea, and observing that this work required them to spend much time in the hold of the ship, I went to the captain and told him that as he had paid me good wages and treated me well, I would work with his people the residue of this day for my victuals and half a gallon of molasses, which he said he would give me. My first object now was to get into the hold of the ship with those who were adjusting the cargo. The first time the men below called for aid, I went to them, and being there, took care to remain with them. Being placed at one side of the hold, for the purpose of packing the bags close to the ship's timbers, I so managed as to leave a space between two of the bags, large enough for a man to creep in and conceal himself. This cavity was near the opening in the centre of the hold that was left to let men get down to stow away the last of the bags that were put in. In this small hollow retreat among the bags of cotton, I determined to take my passage to Philadelphia, if by any means I could succeed in stealing on board the ship at night. When the evening came, I went to a store near the wharf and bought two jugs, one that held half a gallon, and the other a large stone jug holding more than three gallons. When it was dark, I filled my large jug with water, purchased twenty pounds of pilot bread at a bakery, which I tied in a large handkerchief, and taking my jugs in my hand, went on board the ship to receive my molasses of the captain for the labor of the day. The captain was not on board, and a boy gave me the molasses, but under pretense of wanting to see the captain, I sat down between two rows of cotton bales that were stowed on deck. The night was very dark, and watching a favorable opportunity, when the man on deck had gone forward, 
i succeeded in placing both my jugs upon the bags of cotton that rose in the hold almost to the deck in another moment i glided down amongst the cargo and lost no time in placing my jugs in the place provided for them amongst the bales of cotton beside the lair provided for myself soon after i had taken my station for the voyage the captain came on board and the boy reported to him that he had paid me off and dismissed me in a short time all was quiet on board the ship except the occasional tread of the man on watch i slept none at all this night the anxiety that oppressed me preventing me from taking any repose before day the captain was on deck and gave orders to the seamen to clear the ship for sailing and to be ready to descend the river with the ebb tide which was expected to flow at sunrise i felt the motion of the ship when she got under way and thought the time long before i heard the breakers of the ocean surging against her sides in the place where i lay when the hatches were closed total darkness prevailed and i had no idea of the lapse of time or of the progress we made until having at one period crept out into the open space between the rows of cotton bags which i have before described i heard a man who appeared from the sound of his voice to be standing on the hatch call out and say that is cape hatteras i had already come out of my covert several times into the open space but the hatches were closed so tightly as to exclude all light it appeared to me that we had already been at sea a long time but as darkness was unbroken with me i could not make any computation of periods soon after this the hatch was opened and the light was let into the hold a man descended for the purpose of examining the state of the cargo who returned in a short time the hatch was again closed and nothing of moment occurred from this time until i heard and felt the ship strike against some solid body in a short time i heard much noise and a multitude of sounds of various kinds all this satisfied me that the ship was in some port for i no longer heard the sound of the waves nor perceived the least motion in the ship at length the hatch was again opened and the light was let in upon me my anxiety now was to escape from the ship without being discovered by any one to accomplish which i determined to issue from the hold as soon as night came on if possible waiting until some time after daylight had disappeared i ventured to creep to the hatchway and raise my head above deck seeing no one on board i crawled out of the hold and stepped on board a ship that lay alongside of that in which i had come a passenger here a man seized me and called me a thief saying i had come to rob his ship and it was with much difficulty that i prevailed upon him to let me go he at length permitted me to go on the wharf and i once more felt myself a free man i did not know what city i was in but as the sailors had all told me at savannah that their ship was bound to philadelphia i had no doubt of being in that city in going along the street a black man met me and i asked him if i was in philadelphia this question caused the stranger to laugh loudly and he passed on without giving me any answer soon afterwards i met an old gentleman with drab clothes on as i could see by the light of the lamps to him i propounded the same question that had been addressed a few moments before to the black man this time however i received a civil answer being told that i was in philadelphia this gentleman seemed concerned for me either because of my wretched and ragged appearance or because i was a stranger and did not know where i was whether for one cause or the other i knew not but he told me to follow him and led me to the house of a black man not far off whom he directed to take care of me until the morning in this house i was kindly entertained all night and when the morning came the old gentleman in drab clothes returned and brought with him an entire suit of clothes not more than half worn of which he made me a present and gave me money to buy a hat and some muslin for a couple of shirts he then turned to go away and said i perceive that thee is a slave and has run away from thy master 
thee can now go to work for thy living but take care that they do not catch thee again i then told him that i had been a slave and had twice run away and escaped from the state of georgia the gentleman seemed a little incredulous of that which i told him but when i explained to him the cause of the condition in which he found me he seemed to become more than ever interested in my fate this gentleman whose name i shall not publish has always been a kind friend to me after remaining in philadelphia a few weeks i resolved to return to my little farm in maryland for the purpose of selling my property for as much as it would produce and of bringing my wife and children to pennsylvania on arriving in baltimore i went to a tavern keeper whom i had formerly supplied with vegetables from my garden this man appeared greatly surprised to see me and asked me how i had managed to escape from my master in georgia i told him that the man who had taken me to georgia was not my master but had kidnapped me and carried me away by violence the tavern keeper then told me that i had better leave baltimore as soon as possible and showed me a handbill that was stuck up against the wall of his bar-room in which a hundred and fifty dollars reward was offered for my apprehension i immediately left this house and fled from baltimore that very night when i reached my former residence i found a white man living in it whom i did not know this man on being questioned by me as to the time he had owned this place and the manner in which he had obtained possession informed me that a black man had formerly lived here but he was a runaway slave and his master had come the summer before and carried him off that the wife of the former owner of the house was also a slave and that her master had come about six weeks before the present time and taken her and her children and sold them in baltimore to a slave dealer from the south this man also informed me that he was not in this neighborhood at the time the woman and her children were carried away but that he had received this information from a black woman who lived half a mile off this black woman i was well acquainted with she had been my neighbor and i knew her to be my friend she had been set free some years before by a gentleman of this neighborhood and resided under his protection on a part of his land i immediately went to the house of this woman who could scarcely believe the evidence of her own eyes when she saw me enter her door the first words she spoke to me were lucy and her children have all been stolen away at my request she gave me the following account of the manner in which my wife and children all of whom had been free from their birth were seized and driven into southern slavery a few weeks said she after they took you away and before lucy had so far recovered from the terror produced by that event as to remain in her house all night with her children without some other company i went one evening to stay all night with her a kindness that i always rendered her if no other person came to remain with her it was late when we went to bed perhaps eleven o'clock and after we had been asleep some time we were awakened by a loud rap at the door at first we said nothing but upon the rap being several times repeated lucy asked who was there she was then told in a voice that seemed by its sound to be that of a woman to get up and open the door adding that the person without had something to tell her that she wished to hear lucy supposing the voice to be that of a black woman the slave of a lady living near rose and opened the door but to our astonishment instead of a woman coming in four or five men rushed into the house and immediately closed the door at which one of the men stood with his back against it until the others made a light in the fireplace and proceeded deliberately to tie lucy with a rope search was then made in the bed for the children and i was found and dragged out this seemed to produce some consternation among the captors whose faces were all black but whose hair and visages were those of white men a consultation was held among them the object of which was to determine whether i should also be taken along with lucy and the children or be left behind on account of the interest which my master was supposed to feel for me 
it was finally agreed that as it would be very dangerous to carry me off lest my old master should cause pursuit to be made after them they would leave me behind and take only lucy and the children one of the number then said it would not do to leave me behind and at liberty as i would immediately go and give intelligence of what i had seen and if the affair should be discovered by the members of the abolition society before they had time to get out of maryland they would certainly be detected and punished for the crimes they were committing it was finally resolved to tie me with cords to one of the logs of the house gag me by tying a rope in my mouth and confining it closely to the back of my neck they immediately confined me and then took the children from the bed the oldest boy they tied to his mother and compelled them to go out of the house together the three youngest children were then taken out of bed and carried off in the hands of the men who had tied me to the log i never saw nor heard any more of lucy or her children for myself i remained in the house the door of which was carefully closed and fastened after it was shut until the second night after my confinement without anything to eat or drink on the second night some unknown persons came and cut the cords that bound me when i returned to my own cabin this intelligence almost deprived me of life it was the most dreadful of all the misfortunes that i had ever suffered it was now clear that some slave dealer had come in my absence and seized my wife and children as slaves and sold them to such men as i had served in the south they had now passed into hopeless bondage and were gone for ever beyond my reach i myself was advertised as a fugitive slave and was liable to be arrested at each moment and dragged back to georgia i rushed out of my own house in despair and returned to pennsylvania with a broken heart for the last few years i have resided about fifty miles from philadelphia where i expect to pass the evening of my life in working hard for my subsistence without the least hope of ever again seeing my wife and children fearful at this day to let my place of residence be known lest even yet it may be supposed that as an article of property i am of sufficient value to be worth pursuing in my old age end of chapter twenty part two end of fifty years in chains or the life of an american slave by charles ball